we will begin in John uh, chapter 5 and verses 17 through 24. Jesus offers his defense. For healing the blind man on the Sabbath day. Most of what we're going to study today in your Bible will be in red. Someone has said, and I think this probably is true, uh, it's just a lot of fun to go through the New Testament and just read what's in red. Uh, Because all of those are the words of Jesus um, and... and, um, uh, it's good stuff, Maynard. Uh, it is good stuff. It is. It is the you know. And so today we're going to we're going to study um, uh, Jesus' defense uh, of his healing of this man, uh, not not his ability to heal him, but his authority to heal him. You understand that? No one that no one that I see in in the text question the healing. Isn't that isn't that amazing? No one questions the healing. I mean, I, I mean, here's a man for 38 years was brought to the pool there uh, in uh, Bethesda and laid at the pool for 38 years. He'd been, well, I don't know if he'd been at the pool for 38 years, but they had been, had this disease or this, this lameness, uh, this infirmity for 38 years. And now all of a sudden he's, he's up walking, picking up his blankets and, and uh, heads off into the temple to thank and praise God for what happened to him. No one questions the miracle. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, no one questioned that Lazarus was dead. And yet, the Bible says, some believed, and the next verse said, some went to the Pharisees. No one questioned the miracle. They questioned his authority to do what he did on the Sabbath day. They literally said he blasphemed God in doing what he did. So Jesus' defense, and what we're going to study today for uh, some time, is the equality of God the Father with the Son. Jesus and God are equal. Jesus can do what he did because he is the Son of the Father. And Jesus... Thus being the Son of the Father is God. I have a, I, you know, sometimes I will, well, I, I was thinking about this this week. Sometimes I will make a circle and I'll put God and then Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I was thinking this, I was thinking in the last few days, just by me putting this circle confines them they're not confined there's no there there this circle needs to disappear they are all god and there's none nothing confining to them and so i'm going to stop that <laughs> because you know you i want to try to and and this is uh, uh, this is something that I was discussing this morning uh, when we when we talk about God and and the Son, we have we think in human minds. We're limited in our ability to understand. I, I have theology books that that are I mean big thick volumes of, and 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 it, you can look at each one, each group of books. Every one of them has a different idea. I mean, really, they've studied God. They're digging in like like you might dig in a pecan to get all the meat out of it. 
And I love to do that in the Word of God. I, I love to, to search Scripture. Uh, but we have to look at it in a, uh, a human form. I was talking this morning when I was a, a boy. Uh, I raised on a farm. And, and, and we didn't have money like to kids today and, and things like that. Um, and and, and, and there were, we had a tractor tire out back filled with sand. And if you were fortunate for Christmas, you might have got a Tonka toy. Yes. And you go out to the sand and you play in the sand with a Tonka toy. And maybe if you get two, you can get one that will pick up the dirt and put it in a truck or whatever, you know. You, it, you know. It, or if you didn't, then you'd make something. My father was a whittler. You know what a whittler is? Yes. My father could take, okay, tell me how to, how to say this. A beer case was made out of soft wood. And he could take that and make knives. He could make bow and arrows. And, and, and many of the toys I had, my father had whittled and made toys. But we could sit in this sandbox in this place to play. And, and we could do all kinds of things. We were the god of the sandbox. If we wanted to wipe it clean and start over, we'd wipe it clean and start over. The only difference is, and there's many, well, I say the only difference. We walk away and go to sleep at night. God created everything in six days. And then the Bible said he rested. Understand something. God rested from his creation only. God never rests from his work. His work goes on forever. If God ever rested from his work, this whole universe would just go into chaos. God has always, is always working. Always working. So let's spend a little bit of time. Uh, well, let's read the text. I think I was going to do that a while ago. But Jesus answered them, and, and he's talking to these men. He says, Jesus answered them, My father worketh, here there too, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but he, also, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. That's an important verse. Jesus said, I am God. And understand John in his gospel is presenting the deity of Christ. And on every page, as often as he can, he brings out and stresses the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. And so here we go on. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily. I say unto you, the Son can do nothing um, of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth uh, him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye might marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth the Son honoreth not the Father, he that honoreth not the Son Honoreth not the Father which hath sent me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. 
So Jesus, and, and understand, first you have to understand who he is speaking to. He's speaking to the Jews. Let's, let's, I think that'll be in the next verse, but let's look at verse number 17. And, and I already kind of explained this. God never rests. Verse 17 says, by, uh, Jesus answered, and my father worketh hitherto, and I work. They are always working, and they always work together because they are one. In essence, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all one in essence. They're all one. This is difficult to understand, difficult to believe, because we see them in three separate personalities. So they are all one in essence. What about Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 3 said, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers, unto the prophets, through his son, uh, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, right? And, and by whom he's also made the world. And this is speaking about Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person. Paul, as he writes this in Hebrews, in his very first three verses, lays out the, the deity of Jesus Christ and his equality with the Father, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath by himself purged our sins, set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is God. Jesus is equal to God. He's laying a foundation. Who looks look at the next verse? Therefore the Jews sought to kill him. Why? Well, because he not only had broken the Sabbath. Now, how did Jesus break the Sabbath? He told a man to get up and walk. Who broke the Sabbath? The man got up and walked. Oh, he not, that wasn't breaking the Sabbath. What broke the Sabbath was he picked up a couple blankets that he was laying on. That broke the Sabbath. The laws of the Sabbath, the laws of the Sabbath said if you did it unintentionally, then there was certain things you did to, to ask God for forgiveness or to get forgiveness. If you did it intentionally, if you intentionally picked it up and walked, they could carry you outside and stone you to death. That's how strong it was to break the Sabbath. But who broke the Sabbath? All Jesus did says rise and walk, and he did. But he was being obedient to God. And, and by the way, if I'm laying on the ground and, and, and I can't, for 38 years, I can't walk, and somebody says rise and walk, and I feel that power of the Spirit of God moving through my body, I'm going to get up and walk, run, shout, scream, holler, all over the place. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be party time. I mean, that's something else. Now, here's something that, that I have pondered in my mind a while. It says the Jews. Who's the Jews? Who's he talking about? Well, these Jews, if we go back into um, uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke, you find out that they are the Pharisees, the scribes, uh, the Herodians. These were... These were um, not necessarily priests, they could, have be, they could be priests, but these were the lawyers of the time. These were the wise men. These were men that, that, that uh, literally, like the, like the Supreme Court or like the Congress of the United States, the Supreme Court doesn't make laws. You all understand that, right? The Congress can make laws. Supreme, Supreme Court, that's not their job. Their job is to... Uh, to um, interpret the laws. And, and so these men here, they, they, could, they literally would make laws. They would add to the laws of God. 
Uh, and God laid out everything he needed to lay out. If you go read the, the, the first five chapters of the Bible, believe me, if there's any law that needed to have been written, uh, it would have been written then, right? Well, you say that doesn't apply to today. Well, maybe it should. I don't know. It, it's, uh, uh, maybe it should to some degree. But these, these were men that were... Uh, these were the men that watched out for people to keep the law. It's always it's kind of like law keepers. You know, it's these, these people who, who point the finger at you when you come in and say, you're not dressed right, or your hair's too long, or, or you, you've got a, you, you know, who, you, but, you know, you always said, well, they've got a bunch of other fingers pointing back at them, because who is it that's without sin, Right? I mean, if, if we were to look in their closets, I'm sure we would find a lot of things that, that would uh, disqualify them from being law keepers. But, what's that? <laughs> yes, that, well, in most cases you would. There's a funny thing about law keepers. You know, it's a funny thing about law keepers. Uh, most of them are pointing out others so that they can hide themselves, hide what they do, you know, um, and I want to get into that. Uh, I, you know, there's one thing here that, I, that was um, interesting to me was the word Jews. Um, a few weeks ago, Pastor was talking on, on uh, Wednesday night, and I think it's in chapter 5 of Ezra, I'm not sure, but the word Jews was in there five times. Where did that word, what's the etymology of Jews? Where did that word come from? And I began to question, you know, so I began to look it up, you know, and the Strong's Concordance, you type in the word Jews, and that way you can begin to see where the word came from or where it began. There's two words that we call, we talk to Jewish people about, or we refer to them. Uh, the one word is Hebrews, and the other word is Jews. It's, it's, it, it's kind of a, a strange to me sometimes, it, but this, these are words that if I say Hebrews or Jews, everyone in the world knows who we're talking about, right? Uh, they, I mean, most of the countries of the world try to wipe them off the face of the earth. They want nothing to do with them. Um, but there's, there's, there's a, uh, let's look at the, let's look at it for just a minute. I'll try not to take a lot of time away from, from a lesson. When Abraham, oh, I don't know how to do this. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and when Abraham, this is the Jordan. Uh, Abraham came from Iraq. He followed his father. I say Iraq, it could have been, it, Dad was down in the very far south um, uh, east uh, in, in Iraq, um, Iran, in, in that area. And his family, there was a lot of wars going on. His brother, Haran, was, had been killed. Uh, so the family moved up to a place called Haran. And, and then his father died. And God gave Abraham, spoke to Abraham and said, go. <laughs> and Abraham took off and God told him he's going to give him all the land that he goes. Well, this is Canaan. And the Canaanites looked at anybody that crossed over the Tigris and Euphrates River. They were called Hebrews. So Abraham's family brought not only with them the name Hebrews because they crossed over the Tigris and Euphrates River, but they also brought their language. They come from, now this is before airplanes, before cars and jeeps. and this is, I don't even know if they had mules that they were using very much. No telling, I can't, I can't tell you how many days it would have taken them just to get here. But when anybody that crossed over these rivers, the Canaanites referred to them as Hebrews. And so that name stuck with Abraham. And as he's traveling through Canaan, they would refer to him as the Hebrews. Okay, 
Somebody, uh, the other day I'm driving down the road and I saw like a half a dozen cars with New York license plates. I don't know why they're here. I don't know why they came here. But what do we call New Yorkers? Yankees. Right? Yankees. Now, actually, the Dutch settled New York before the Yankees, before the Italians came in. But we refer to them as Yankees. And they came with a different language. They don't speak y'alls and all of that kind of stuff. Right? So this is, what, this is what has happened when Abraham came over. And so from Abraham, we get the name Hebrews. And that's the Hebrew language was carried over with him. And they, the name was carried on. It was given to them by the Canaanites because they passed over the, the Tigris-Euphrates River. Anybody that came on the other side of the Jordan and all of these rivers, they called them Hebrews. All right, so now let's look for a second at Jews. Where did that come from? Well, I guess I could have left some of this up here. Uh, there was, and you all know this is the Sea of Galilee, and this is the Dead Sea, and, and this is Israel. What, what we have as, 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 as the Hebrews settled in, and then they went into captivity, uh, in Egypt, and then they came back into Israel. Uh, they come back around this way, and they crossed over into Jericho, and they began to take the land. Then God separated them after David uh, was king. After Solomon died, his son Rehoboam um, from the tribe of Judah was king of Israel, uh, and Jeroboam was given by an angel of God the uh, northern ten tribes, which really only became nine, but there's, the northern tribes became the kingdom of Israel. They were split. And so you had Judah in the southern tribes, and the, and the, and the, the rest of the tribes, uh, actually Judah, Benjamin, Dan was over here, but Dan became a northern tribe. Dan actually moved way over here. But you had Judah, Benjamin, and Simeon, all down here. The southern kingdom was the kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom was the kingdom of Israel. They began to call all of these in the southern kingdom Judites. They began to call them Jews. So this southern kingdom in 2 Kings chapter 16, Ahaz was king. And I think that's the first time the mention of Jews is mentioned in the Bible. The southern kingdom were the Judites, kingdom of Judah, the Jews. When they went into captivity after, after uh, Egypt came in and kind of took over, and then Assyria uh, come over and, 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 and uh, 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 took over and Medes and Persians and you all know as we, on, from Ezra. Uh, but they went into captivity for 70 years. They come out of captivity, they came back into Jerusalem and rebuilt the wall and pastors talking about this in Ezra. And so what we have, they were called Jews. If you come into the New Testament... The Jews, by that time, were all the tribes. Anybody that was left, not the Samaritans, understand they are Samaritans. They were a blend, a mix. But there were some of the other tribes of Naphtali and Zebulon and Issachar and Asher. As a matter of fact, if we go into the New Testament, we find the Jews, I mean Ju Judah, we find Benjamin, Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin, and that's a southern. We find the Levites, right? And when Jesus went into the temple, there was a prophetess there, and her, she was from Asher. Asher was all the way up in Lebanon, up in that area 
where they had settled. But after the, after the uh, 70 years in captivity and after coming back, those true Israelites began to gather back into Israel again, and they were all called Jews. So today, I have a friend that, that comes to visit me every once in a while. He sells us tools, and uh, he's a Jew. I have a big chart on, on my wall, and he went over and showed me where he was the tribe of the tribe of Issachar. And Issachar, Naphtali, and um, uh, Zebulon, and Issachar, uh, and... Uh, well, they settled in around the Sea of Galilee. Asher was over here. Uh, you, of course, you had Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh over there, and Ephraim was here. And, and anyways, all the tribes. But that's how we got the word Jews. Any questions? This is clear as mud. I don't know. It was interesting to me. So... Anyway, Jesus, Jesus was talking to the Jews. They were, they're called Jews, and today we call them the Jews, and it's okay. It's not a slang. It's not a negative connotation. That's who they are. Uh, and Jesus goes into detail about his relationship with the Father, verses 19 through 20. So, uh, uh, so let's look at it. Uh, then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son of Man can do nothing. Now that does not express that Jesus has any inabilities. He is God. But that which he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these do also doeth the Son likewise. Uh, what this is doing is, again, it's showing the equality of Jesus with the Father. The Pharisees have, have charged Jesus with breaking the Sabbath and blasphemy. Uh, now he doubles down as he claims the equality with the Father. The Father loveth the Son. I was very fortunate as a young man. My father loved me. I was walking, we were, had a devotion last night, and, and uh, it was talking about enjoying God. Enjoying God. And I talked about how much fun I enjoyed being with my father. I was fortunate. I mean, my father adopted me when I was a young man, and I, I, but he treated me as a son. He disciplined me as a son. He loved me as a son. Uh, I, was as his, I was as his firstborn son. Uh, and, and, but the father loves the son. Uh, when Jesus was baptized, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased in Luke. In, in Matthew it says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Uh, John, in, in the next verse, is, is, is uh, in John chapter 3, and verse number 35, it says, the father loveth the son and giveth all things into his hand. All things into his hand. That part of that verse number 20 it says. He loveth the son and showeth him all things that he doeth. And he will show him greater works than these. And I love these last words. That ye might marvel. Marvel at him. I mean I, I'm, I'm still in amazement. That can Jesus can walk in amongst a multitude of of people in the earlier, earlier verses of this chapter walk in amongst a multitude of people, speak to a man, and tell him, take up thy bed and walk. What amazes me is how that whole multitude of people didn't just take up their bed and walk. He didn't limit by giving a name. It, it, I just, I, and yet, you know that they had to marvel. Oh my, look at him, he's walking. Why aren't you walking? They had to marvel at what he was doing and how he did this. 
I mean, here this guy, every, I mean, you know it had to be a pathetic looking sight. He had no friends. His family wasn't there. Nobody was there to help him to get into water. There was no way he could get in the water. And yet he had hope that something might happen in his life to get him healed of what he had. Jesus came in, his, in the midst of that multitude of people and told him, take up your bed and walk. Why didn't they all take up their bed and walk? I'll never understand it. Greater works than these are going to be seen. And we're going to read about the greater works in the next verse. I, I, I mention in here that Jesus went on to feed 5,000. He went on to walk on the water. He went on to raise Lazarus from the dead that had been dead for four days. Now, when you're dead for four days, that's pretty dead. I mean, that's pretty dead. And then when they wrap you up in all those clothing and everything, I mean, you're dead. Okay, we all agree with that. So that's pretty great work, to raise the dead, to raise the dead. But you want to understand something? Example, Jesus walking on the water, and I've mentioned this many times before. That's only a miracle to you or I. It's not a miracle to Jesus. Why? He created the water. It's his water. He can do with it what he wants to do with it. His, Jesus walking on the water was a miracle to you and I as we see it in the minds that we have as the Spirit of God reveals to us. He walked on the water. That's a miracle to us, to him. That's, that's, he created the water. He can do with it whatever he pleases. If he wants to walk on it, he can do whatever he pleases with it. And so here we go with verse number 21. He said, For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. So here are the greater works. Is the quickening or raising of the dead, and the other is the judging or the condemnation. And we're going to see it. The Father's work, he raises up the dead and quickeneth whom he will. In Genesis chapter 6 and verses 5 through um, 8 and Genesis 19. These are areas where God took, like Noah. You remember Noah? Y'all know Noah? He had a few animals in a boat. But what did God do? Like I was talking about in the sand pile, I could, I could just kind of sweep and sweep and clean things off and start over, couldn't I? What did God do in Genesis chapter 6 through 8? He just cleaned the slate. The flood, the great flood came. God cleaned the slate, left eight people. Those eight people produced and, and went on to create the people that we have today. And if God today gets tired and, of our sin and our filthiness, He can clean the slate. The trumpets can blow at any time. You and I can be gone at any time. And then he begins the slate cleaning process. You think that's not going to happen? I hope you as a child of God understands that is going to happen. One of the fortunate things about being older, I remember the 50s, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. And now I look at today. Whoa. Whoa. Uh, whoa, it is, it is so different today. People running up and down streets just hitting people for no reason, killing people for no reason. I mean, evil is taken over. And, and nobody wants to stop it. I, I mean, it's it just nobody wants to stop it. Son's work, you can look at that. Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Uh, understand here, 
the, if the Father judges, here's the thing, the Father judges no man apart from the Son. That's how that should read. The Father judges no man apart from the Son. Um, and you can re read the verses there, uh, verse 23, that all men should honor the Son. Honor is the fear of God awakened by the knowledge of coming judgment. Let me say that one more time. Honor is the fear of God awakened by the knowledge of coming judgment. I think we could honestly say today, men and women do not fear God today. They, fear, they don't fear judgment today. They don't fear judgment today. You can put them in jail, let them back out, they go do the same thing. Just over and over and over and over and over again. To honor the Son is, to not honor the Son is to not honor God. And then he goes on in verse number 24. And we'll carry on from verse 24 next week. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. The word condemnation is the same word for judge, for judging, will not be judged. Our sins were judged on Jesus Christ on Calvary as he shed his blood for our sins. That's where our condemnation is. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit of God. All right, we'll get into that more next week. I took up a little time on some etymology there, but we'll... Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you for today. What a blessing it has been. Father, thank you for the Word of God that we can open it up and and we can begin to see how great you are. Father, we just pray you'll bless our service this morning. Thank you for this great number that we've had. Pray that you'll just encourage us and strengthen us in the word of God. And as a, as a pastor breaks open the book of Revelation for us, may we understand time is short. Many things are going to be happening here in the near future that we don't understand but they're coming. And Father, I pray you'll bless now the service in Jesus' name. Amen.